Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another Urban Wine Club webinar. Today's webinar is a very uh, exciting one. It's a very special one. We have a very amazing guest with us. Um, we're going we're gonna to go back to the VIP of wines, to France. And before we get into all that, let me introduce my co-host, Fati Stamos. Hello, Fati. How are you, Ari? Good. How are you doing? Excellent. Actually, I've been waiting for this specific webinar for a long time because this region of France that we're going to discuss is dear to my heart. Um, but it's also a region that is either misunderstood. Uh, there's barely any awareness that this region does exist amongst wine drinkers today, believe it or not. But I think it's also important to actually understand this region because it does present a lot of principles and fundamentals of what it means to actually produce good wine. And with us tonight, not just a special guest, but a good friend of ours, um, and don't let the accent fool you, but he is French. Uh, with us tonight is uh, Nathan Derry, who is the district manager of Dreyfus Ashby and Company, which is a important supplier, in my opinion, especially in the US market for bringing some of the best productions coming out of France and other parts of the world too, but we're specifically talking about France. And what we're specifically talking about in general is we're gonna be discussing Burgundy, not the color, but the region. So with us, Nathan, Nathan, so thank you so much for joining us out of your busy schedule during some very challenging times. It's an honor and a pleasure to have you with us tonight. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you guys for having me. Um, I'm delighted we've been talking about that webinar for so long. And, and now it's tonight. So I'm, I'm very happy. I'm thrilled to be here. And we're going to talk about Hopefully, we're going to bring some Burgundy too. First. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and Nathan, to my comments earlier, I, you know, uh, I, this was a great opportunity because I've gone through so many different circumstances about trying to present wines from this area. And it's either unfamiliar or people think that it's super expensive to try wines from this area. So why don't we just quickly dive into and make our guests and audience aware of, you know, Burgundy and what it means to the wine world. Absolutely. So I'm going to share my screen. I have some uh, cool pictures um, about Burgundy and we're going to just, can you guys see the screen okay? Yes, absolutely. Beautiful. So um, as Ara said, I work for Dreyfus HB, which imports um, wine from all over the world, but we are very strong on uh, French wine. And our main brand is Joseph Drouin. So Joseph Drouin is a, is a producer that is based in Burgundy. Um, the estate was founded in 1880. So as you can see, uh, they've been there for five generations now. So they know exactly what Burgundy is and they have seen everything. Um, and we're gonna we're gonna start um, the presentation, and I really want to welcome you to my world, which is Burgundy. And it, the presentation is really a one-on-one -on -one presentation. I just want you, the members, to understand what the region is, and I'm gonna try to demonstrate that some of the best wine in the world are coming from this region, and you can afford those wines. They are not as expensive as what you may think they are. Um, so first of all, where is Burgundy? So Burgundy is in France. Uh, it's in the um, southeast of Paris. And as you can see on that map, um, Burgundy is quite large. It's a large region, but when we're going to go deep into the production, you will see that it's a, even though it's large geographically, the production is very small. So the northern part is Chablis. So Chablis is considered uh, part of Burgundy. So you might have that misconception about Chablis where your grandmother might have experienced some Chablis that was probably wine from that region that was wine from the US. And it was labeled as Chablis, but it was not from that region. To your point, Nathan, before you go any further, I just want to make a comment to that point is that years ago, maybe 30 years ago, there was so much production in the US that was labeling wine from California. White was labeled as Chablis and the red was labeled as Burgundy. Absolutely. 
Um, so now the, the, the French law is protecting the wine, so you cannot label champagne, any wines, even if it's sparkling, coming out of the champagne region. And it's the same for Chablis, so we should be protected, even though there's still some uh, boxed wine made in California labeled as Chablis. But let's keep moving. Because yes. We can talk about that for hours. Right. Uh, so Chablis is in the north, and then you have the motherland of Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, um, which is the Côte d'Or. The Côte d'Or is composed of two different parts, the Côte de Nuit in the north and the Côte de Bonne in the south. And then as soon as um, you keep going down towards the Rhone Valley, you're going to eat the Maconnais, and finally you're going to eat the Beaujolais, almost um, next to the town of Lyon. Um, and Beaujolais, so it's a specific region, is also part of Burgundy. So this is a picture that has been taken in the vineyard of um, Chablis Grand Cru Les Clos. So as you can see, there's a little bit of a hill, but it's not very deep. All the uh, rows of vines are aligned. It's a very neat vineyard, and this is one of the best Chablis that you can find. So it's labeled as Grand Cru. And a little bit later in the presentation, I'm going to explain the classification of Burgundy. Excellent. Um, so we were talking about Chablis. Now we're going um, to the Côte de Nuit. So as you can see, this is way flatter. This mm. is the town of Chambol Musigny, one of the most famous vineyards in the Côte de Nuit. Um, and so that's a um, picture taken from, from above. But uh, let me tell you, this is pretty flat. There's a foothill where the forest is on the background but it's flat. This is a picture from the Maconnais uh, with the Roche de Solutre, which is quite famous. So Maconnais, you might be familiar with the wine Macon Village, uh, this is from that region. Um, and as you can see, there's two parts in that region. There's a flat side, which is usually the village wine, and there's a foothill, and that's where the best wines are from. Um, and is that because of elevation? Yes, uh, it's partially because of the elevation. And we're, we're going to go deep into that. Uh, but elevation is definitely one of the main criteria. Um, so picture from the Beaujolais. And again, that's just to give you an idea of what the region looks like. Mm. All right. So what are we producing in Burgundy? Well, we're producing two grapes varietal, Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. And when I say we are producing Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, I just want you to understand that the motherland of Chardonnay and the motherland of Pinot Noir is Burgundy. We in Burgundy were the very first region back to the ancient Romans to produce those grape varietals. We were producing at the time, 2000 years ago, a lot of different grape varietals, but throughout the years, the selection of Chardonnay and Pinot Noir were made because they were the two grapes, white and red, that were producing the best wine in this area. So in California, you can find so many different grape varietals. You can buy Sauvignon Blanc, you can buy Chardonnay, you can buy Chenin Blanc, you can buy whatever you can even imagine. In Burgundy, the only thing you will find is Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. Um, and in the, in the Beaujolais area, you also, uh, you will find some Gamay, um, but that's uh, that's another. Oh. There's a tiny bit of Bourgogne Ligoté production, but it's 0 0.1 percent. So just to make it easy, Burgundy is Chardonnay for the white, and it's Pinot Noir for the red. So if, if so, basically, if someone purchases a bottle that says Burgundy and it's red, it's not going to tell you the varietal. So you're drinking Pinot Noir, and if you're buying a white bottle, you're drinking Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. If you're buying a burgundy bottle that is not Chardonnay and you can come across some Bourgogne Ligoté, it will say on the label Bourgogne Ligoté. OK. Um, so we've talked about the geography of um, the burgundy region. Now what I really want you to understand, because we can just call the wine burgundy, right? We, we can get a wine from Chablis, and we can get a wine from uh, the Maconnais, and they are both from Burgundy, correct? correct? So why do we call those regions differently? 
and there are so many things, but one of the most important things is the terroir. And terroir is a French word that means a lot of things. Um, terroir is the soil. Terroir is the, the sun exposure. Terroir is how the climate and, and the, the rain reacts with the wine. So terroir is a lot of things. And on top of that in Burgundy, we've created climates. So climate is even deeper than terroir because climate is a specific, very small area made of five, six, seven, eight, ten rows of vines. And inside the same town, Chambol Musigny, you can have 100 or 200 different climates. Wow. That's why Burgundy tends to be confusing sometimes. It's because there are so many different climates that you don't know what you're buying. But after this presentation, you might be able to find the good wine for you. So is it because of the landscape, the elevations that creates the Absolutely. microclimate? Yes. Um, so just to give you an idea, I'm going to show you a few different pictures. So I started to show you the picture of the vineyard of Chablis. So this is a Kimmeridgian rocks. Um, so this is the main soil in Chablis. And as you can see in that picture, there's a lot of fossilized mussels, shells, and oyster shells. Yeah. In Chablis, um, it used to be an ocean, an ocean right there, and all the, um, the animals that were living in the oceans died, and they basically went in the bottom of the oceans. And after so many million years, it fossilized, and this is now the soil in Chablis. So when you drink a Chablis, why do we say that Chablis goes extremely well with oysters? It's literally just because the soil is made of fossilized oyster shells. Wow. wow. We're, we're, we're not really, we don't invent anything in Burgundy. We just take what nature is giving us and we just put it in the glass. So if there's oyster shells in my vineyard, what would be the best pairing for my wine? Well, maybe it would be oysters well that so that so basically that soil composition is what derives the characteristics through the vines into the grapes Absolutely. to to the to the vines to the grapes and finally what's in your glass correct um, okay. that's actually very amazing to me I, I did not know that at all and that's very very interesting uh-huh so now we're around. going. Now we're going south. We're going uh, to um, the outskirts of the town of Bonn. So we are in the Côte d'Or. So remember, we had Chablis, and then the Côte d'Or made of Côte de Nuit and Côte de Bonn. The Clos des Mouches Vineyard is located in the Côte de Bonn, and again, we are still in Burgundy. We are producing red and white wine on that specific vineyard of the Clos des Mouches, and you can see that the, the soil is completely different. The soil here is made of, um, of um, limestone. Mm. And so obviously the wine will taste completely differently than Chablis, obviously because of the geographic part of Burgundy where it's coming from, but also mainly because of what the terroir, the soil, is giving us. So we are not on a Kimmer region, we are on a very poor limestone. So the wine would be completely different. Isn't it, isn't it amazing, and I'll say this to you, Ari, what happened a million years ago when glaciers were carving out landscapes and depositing what they were dragging from thousands of miles away is what developed in, in an area like Burgundy and parts of France that created the soil composition to make these fantastic wines because Absolutely. of the evolution of, of the development of you know, nature. It, it really is an amazing thing, and it, I don't know, it, do you call it lucky that this ended up in an area of France? Because I could never imagine life where, where France wasn't like the heart of like wine <laughs> production. Right? It's it, because of those specific circumstances that allowed that to happen. And, and you, you also have to uh, factor in the history. Um, just because it's, it's in the old world, the, the Romans were making wines all over France 2,000 or 2,500 years ago. And because we have so much 
background on wine production, we know exactly what kind of grapes can grow on what kind of soil can grow in that specific region. And there are some regions in France that are not producing anymore just because the wine was not at the quality level that the market wanted. So we said, okay, we're gonna stop doing wine here and we're gonna focus all of our efforts in Burgundy because Burgundy we know for so many reasons because of the Kimi region soil, because of the elevation, because of the sun exposure. Here in the vineyard of Chablis, we can produce great wine. Great, let's invest in there because we know that it's gonna produce some mm. great wine. And we have the chance to have more than 2000 years of wine production history in France. Amazing. So again, just to show you other pictures, because I think showing pictures will make you understand the diversity of the vineyard in Burgundy. Um, so that's another soil. So now we're in Merceau. Merceau is 10 minutes away drive from the Clos des Mouches, which is right there. Um, and so in Merceau, we just, the entire town of Merceau is mostly, uh, I won't say just, but mostly producing Chardonnay. There's a tiny bit um, of a red production of Merceau, but 99.9% .9 of the Merceau, the Merceau would be white, Chardonnay. And as you can see, this is, again, a different type of soil, a different type of limestone. This is a very white limestone, almost like chalk but it's not it's limestone but it's a very white dry soil um so it almost look like it's like snow covered absolutely yes but it's not this i mean it's oh, yes, the, the natural it's like that yes and so again 10 minutes away from here wow. 10 minutes from there and you arrive here different soil obviously different soil different wine amazing yeah. and now we're going to the Beaujolais area, which is the very bottom part of Burgundy. And now we're gonna find another kind of soil, which is granite. So it used to be very volcanic over there. And so you have a, a granitic volcanic soil. So the wine would be completely different. And that's part of the reason why we're not gonna grow Pinot Noir there. We're gonna grow Gamay, because Gamay is a great varietal by its structure and the acidity of the grape, we love a granitic volcanic soil. So again, so many different years of winemaking throughout the history wow. would make the winemaker decides that let's forget about Pinot Noir over here and let's just focus on Gamay because we know that this grape vital will grow well. So the, the this slide and the next slides to me are the most important slides to understand Burgundy. Mm. Why Burgundy is so sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes confusing. So in the Burgundy region, there's a ranking. The ranking is called classification. And a little bit like Bordeaux has different growths, first growth, second growth, third growth, Burgundy by law has different classification. So you start with the regional appellation. This is very, this is the flattest part of the valley. And this is on the outskirts of the town. And this wine, the regional, that's going to be that kind of wine, which is lab labeled as Bourgogne, Chardonnay. This comes from a regional appellation. Then when you get close to the town, you will be in the village appellation. The village appellation is past the outskirts of the regional and you're in a specific delimited um, geographical spot. Above that, so then you go on the hill because there's basically a, a big hill in Burgundy and then becomes a little bit flatter. So on the hill, there's the sweet spot. And the sweet spot is the premier cru and the grand cru. So the Grand Cru is the best of the best of that specific village. So we take the town of Chambol Musigny, the best of the best, the Grand Cru in Chambol Musigny is called Musigny. Oh, that's another funny story about Burgundy because all those names, they have big, long names. And the reason why they have big, long names is because it used to be the town of, the town of Chambol. And the people in Chambol decided to added the name of their most famous Grand Cru. 
So the town of Chambol became Chambol Musigny. The town of Chambertin became finally the town of, I mean, the town of Gevray, sorry. The town of Gevray became the town of Gevray Chambertin because the most famous Grand Cru vineyard in Gevray is called Chambertin. And you can take the entire Burgundy name of the towns and you will find Puligny Montrachet, Chassagne Montrachet is the town of Puligny, the most famous vineyard Montrachet, the most famous Grand Cru Montrachet, it becomes Puligny Montrachet. So this is just a trick for you to so remember. What's the most famous Grand Cru? Does that mean though, with those labeling on the wines, does that mean that wines that are labeled with that second name is that they have grapes from those vineyards? It just means, so the town basically changed the the original name of the town right back back in history it used to be the town of puligny and now if you go there you yes. will see that it's now named the town of puligny montrachet so it was just the, it was the early stage of marketing i would say gotcha like 60 70 years ago so it doesn't necessarily mean that those that specific wine has grapes from Montreux. from the montrachet no it doesn't okay but but the town of puligny montrachet so if you look at the at the slide the so the village all the grapes if you see on the label puligny montrachet all the grapes as by law to come from the town of puligny montrachet right so it's your choice as a winemaker to declassify your premier or some grand cru into your puligny montrachet you can absolutely do that but you cannot take village level wine and put on the label grand cru so you could go from the top and, and lower the quality of your wine. That's absolutely fine. But you could not go from the bottom and no. higher the quality of your wine. And going back to village wines, just to, to confirm and clarify, is that in order to re receive a village status, your grapes have to be grown within the territory of that village. Absolutely, yes. And you can see here, there's the two um, uh, black lines. So the grapes has to come from that yellow part. If it comes from the green part, or well, I mean, if it comes from the green part, then forget about it. It's just mm -hmm. general level wine. If it comes from the pink or the orange part, then you have the choice as a winemaker to decide if you want the label you to put on the label premier cru or if you want to just keep it as a village. That's absolutely interesting. And I'm assuming that as you go up the hill, so does the price point. Absolutely. Okay. This is the hill of price. Yes. Um, and so you will understand why sometimes Burgundy is expensive. And I'm not saying it's always expensive. We have two great examples tonight of wine that are very affordable and they are very high quality wines. This is the, the pyramid of the appellations. So we were talking about regional village, village premier cru and grand cru. If you look at the Grand Cru appellation, there's only 33 vineyards in the entire Burgundy that can be called Grand Cru. And it represents 1.6% of the total production. Oh, wow. So then you are in, in a market where supply meets demand. And this is obviously the best wine, but there's only 1% of the production that comes from those Grand Cru appellation. Obviously, you will have to pay the price for those wines. Just, just for uh, for giggles, can you give us maybe like a, a price range of what Grand Cruz might be? Absolutely, yeah. Um, so we just uh, finished the 2018 on on the Massachusetts market. We just finished the 2018 uh, Grand Cru wines for Joseph Drouin, and we're getting the 2019 right now. Yeah. I would say that a, a, a case, a six pack of Musigny Grand Cru from Joseph Drouin will sell on the market right now for um, close to $7,000. 7000 for a six pack. Yes. That's retail. That's retail. Okay. Ari, can you order me some? <laughs> oh, now, he's, now he's not talking. I, I know. I, uh, know I, 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 I kept myself on mute on purpose for that question. <laughs> Um, and so, so again, and, and again, that's the, the pyramid, right? So then right under the Grand Cru, you have the Premier Cru. So Premier Cru 
11% of the total production, you have really, really high quality wines. Mm. Now we are a little bit larger. We have a little over 500 appellations that can be called Premier Cru. Under that, you have the Village level. Village is really, really good wine, again. Um, and there's only 45 villages that can be called themselves village. So some villages are next to most famous villages and they're not gonna use their name, they're gonna use the name of the next town. So sometimes it's three or four villages together that are inside that one village appellation. Um, and then you have the regional production. So regional production is half of what Burgundy is producing. So for us, it's great because it gives us wine that we can put on the market at a very affordable price. Even though Burgundy is really hot, even though Burgundy seems expensive, we have quality wines that are made from very good vineyards and they are affordable. Nathan, could you give us possibly a number this great area how much wine collectively altogether is being produced out of burgundy is there a number that you can tell us absolutely look at that ah so this is why burgundy is expensive <laughs> you need to understand that we have almost 1500 climates. So climates, again, is that, that single plot that are very specific, distinctive things that makes that a climate. So the soil, the sun exposure, the kind of rocks, pebbles, whatever is in that vineyard, the, everything makes Amazing. a climate. Just to compare with California, California, you just have 130 AVAs, and that's California. So mm. in Burgundy, we're so detailed. And again, we're talking about a few rows. So you can create a climate based on three, four, five, six rows of vines. So how much wine are you going to produce from that climate? Few cases right. here and there. So wow. the production of Burgundy. And again, don't forget that half of it is regional wine, is 17 million cases. California is almost 10 times bigger in terms of production. Wow. Fascinating. And we also have so many different producers. I just yeah, realizing, wow. Yep. We have the same, basically the same amount of producer in Burgundy that California. What does it mean? That California, it's usually a huge vineyard and in Burgundy, it's just a couple of rows. So that's to give you an idea of what you can find um, in the cellar if you go in Burgundy. Uh, so I don't know if um, your members or um, you even have been traveling to wine region in different parts of the world. But what I find fascinating is if you go to the old world, so we're talking France, Italy, Spain, Germany, um, Greece, and if you the new world, which will be Australia, New Zealand, um, the US, obviously. When you go to the new world, everything seems new just because the wine production is something quite recent. Right. If you go to France or Italy or Spain, they've been making, uh, they've been making wine for, again, 2000 years, right? So this is a vaulted cellar in the town of Bonn that has been constructed um, in, the, in the 14th century. And this is where they still make the wine. Wow. So Amazing. think about that in terms of economics as well. Let's say you want to create your own vineyard in California. You will have to buy the land. You will have to create a winery. Creating a winery is a lot of investment just for the equipment. When you go to the old world, all of that is already paid for and has been paid for, I don't know, 200, 300, 400 years ago. The family is transmitting the vineyard, used to be from son to son and now from, since Napoleon, from son to all the kids and then all the kids, all the kids, all the kids. Um, so, 
My point being, when you're in a wine shop, and let's say you have a budget of $30 to spend, what do you think would be the highest quality at that price point? To me, and again, it's just, it, it just a question of taste as well, but to me, old, old world wine in general, just because you don't have to factor in the financial burden of the newer, newer producer. They will have to pay the bank for the mortgages on the land. They will have to pay the, um, the, for the equipment. And in the old world, producers don't have that financial burden. So on the, on the glass, when you buy a glass of Burgundy or Loire Valley or Spanish wine or Italian wine, Usually, and again, it just, it, it's just, it's not a 100% accurate rule, but it's just my experience, you get at a specific price point, higher quality wine in the old world. Not saying that the new world wine is bad. I, I drink new world wine. I enjoy new world wine. I'm just talking about price point. If, if I can, that, is, that is a very good point. Nate. If very I can add to your comment, Nathan, about, about your comparison, what I wanted to add is that from what my experience is in what I've um, seen is that wine from the old world is wine that's made in the vineyard. And some, you know, what does that mean? And for me, the way to express that wine is made in the vineyard is that it's all about, it starts in the vineyard. It starts with the, the production of, you know, the grape and how it's tend to and how the vineyards are tend to, because if your, your vineyards are well maintained, then you don't need nothing else when you bring and you transport the grapes back to your winery to make the wine. Whereas in the, in the new world, this is this could be debatable, that wine is made in the facility, meaning that grape production is brought back and then they figure out how they're gonna make good wine from the grapes that they've just, they just brought in with all other influences and um, uh, what's the other word I'm looking for? Interventions. But Absolutely. wine from the old world is made in the vineyard. Absolutely. And again, it, it's, it's not disrespectful for the new old wine. Again, I, I just want to say it out loud and clear. I love new world wine and I, I will drink and I will keep drinking new world wine. Just, it's just a, a, a basic rule that you could keep that in, in your mind. And when you go to a wine store, just keep that in mind. And it doesn't mean that you should always... Well, all the wine. If, if if I can make another point to your comment, Nathan, as you know, we, we get older, I guess, and our palate develops, we were more introduced to New World wine in the beginning stages of drinking, and then as the palate develops, we don't care as much for New World wines, and we enjoy Old World wines. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so again, another really cool picture. This is a very very old wine press. This is at the drawing and they are still using it. And as a matter of fact, this year, so 2021, uh, we're gonna celebrate the 100, 100 years of the buying of the Clos des Mouches Vineyards. And we're gonna use that press to do a special cuvee. So mm. it's in function. So it's wow. amazing. I mean, it's, yes. So this is another map. I like maps because you can, you can see what we are talking about. So again, just a refresher, Chablis, Côte de Nuit, Côte de Bonne, and then Côte Chalonnaise, and then Beaujolais. Um, so those are really nice pictures, but I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna spend too much time on that. What's really important is the listening to nature. Everybody now is talking about organic grain, sometimes biodynamic, where does that come from? What does that mean? And is that something that you could feel in your glass? So to answer those three questions, organic means that you're not gonna use any chemical, I mean, you can use chemicals that are allowed in the organic world. Biodynamic means that you will use only organic material to treat any kind of issues that you can find in the vineyard. So 
if you have some bugs, maybe you will introduce other bugs that are not gonna be harmful for the grapes, but they are gonna eat the bugs that are harmful for the vineyard. So this is biodynamic. And it's a whole really complex strategy of vineyard management. This is biodynamic. Where does that come from? Biodynamic come from Burgundy. The motherland of biodynamy is Burgundy. One of the pioneers of biodynamy is the Drouin family. So I just want to put that out there. Everybody's talking about biodynamy. Biodynamy before Burgundy at the beginning. So what they do, they basically grow their own rootstock. Why? Well, because they can control the quality of the clone and they decide what clone will go in which vineyard. And they know because of history of winemaking in the same family that this specific route will go very well in this specific vineyard. Natural compost, that's very important. Why would you buy compost? You can do it yourself and you could do it naturally. So press your wine, you can reuse all the materials that you're not going to use to put in your wine and you could create compost with that. Just tiny stuff like that. Um, flowing by us, um, that's also something, as you can see, the rows are quite next to each other. You can have uh, mechanical uh, equipment like tractors and stuff, but that's going to arm the soil. A tractor is really, really heavy, so you're going to you're going to condense the soil. That's not something that you want. So using a horse, it's natural. The horse, by his work, will not damage uh, the soil, and that's one of the many techniques that they are using in Burgundy and at the drawing. Wow. So that's a really nice picture. I love that picture. Um, the cycle of the planets, this is another component. I'm not going to enter too much in the details of the cycle of the planet because I, I don't truly believe in it, but they are very, very believers of um, following the cycle. The uh, astrology? In order to harvest, in order to do some kind of treatment, when are you going to prune, when are you going to de-leaf, stuff like that. Interesting. Using plants. So because we cannot use chemicals in the vineyard, we have to come up with solutions um, when sometimes we have disease or stuff. Or, I mean, anything, you know, disease is a great example. So um, they have some solutions using plants and doing concoction of biodynamic. Um, I mean, it's a concoction called biodynamic concoction, and it's a preparation made out of, of plants, basically. Um, or herbs. Herbs works fine as well. Um, Something that you should know as well about Burgundy, and you have been exposed to that in the last couple of vintages, is because of global warming, Burgundy has been heated every single vintage since 2016 by the elements. What does that mean? Frost, air, flood, we did add fires, we had fires in Oregon because we own property in Oregon as well, but Burgundy has been severely impacted by the elements since 2016. This is also why the price at the store might be a little bit higher on some vintages because we've been pretty unlucky, I would say, with the elements. Um, so this is a picture of the vineyard of Chablis. To prevent the frost, they light up candles in the vineyard. And doing that, you can gain one or two degrees Celsius, and you might be able to save 100% of your production from the frost doing that. Those are candles? Yes. Wow. Are, I mean, it's big candles. It's not, it's not small candles, but it's... But still... Fire pit, it's not really like a fire pit, but that's what they are doing right there is just to protect the vineyard from the frost. Um, and yes, that's, that's literally what they're doing. 
Um, another technique, but only the very, 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 very wealthy people are doing, you can rent an helicopter and leave it on top of your vineyard for the whole night. And the, the creation of the, the, the airflow by the helicopter will protect the vineyard from the frost. I'm telling you, nobody in Burgundy is doing it, but I've seen some vineyards uh, literally renting an helicopter overnight to protect the vineyard from the frost. Wow. Um, the other technique um, is to actually protect your leaves and, and your uh, bourgeon, the tiny buds, by actually freezing them. So it's kind of counterproductive, but if you freeze them the right way, you will protect them. So that's what this vineyard also in Chablis is doing. Um, literally sending a tiny bit of water on the, the vineyard, and that's going to protect the buds exactly like in this picture. So this bud would be protected from the actual frost just because it has been frozen the right way. So this is another way of protecting. All of those techniques are expensive. So when you say, well, I mean, Burgundy is expensive. Yes, we are trying our best to produce as much wine, as much quality wine as we can. And as you've seen, Burgundy is not a huge area of production. We are talking 17 million cases compared to whatever it is, 155 million in California. So we have to create new techniques and new strategy to protect the vineyard. Um, any questions so far from, from the members? Do you have- There's some questions, Nathan. Yeah, there's, there's some questions that were coming in while you were talking. Um, so we could read some of them. Uh, some of them are gonna jump back to what you were talking about, but let's, uh, let's just go through a couple of them. Um, one is, is Beaujolais within Burgundy? Yes, so yes, it is inside the Burgundy world, but it's a specific region um, in, in Burgundy. Yes, uh, I, I know it's not really clear, but yes. So it is part of Burgundy, even though it's kind of not part of Burgundy. All right, and um, somebody wrote, I assume the word for the color Burgundy comes from the red color of wine from Burgundy. I, that sounds true, but you guys so, may know that. Yes, I, I would say yes. In France, we don't use Burgundy as a color uh, much, um, but yes, I would ask, I would definitely assume that the color Burgundy come from the light, thin skip grape varietal that is Pinot Noir, and it reflects as a as a deeper red or a lighter, very light purple kind of thing. Yes. Um, what is Beaujolais Nouveau? Perfect. Great. So. Let's talk about Beaujolais for a couple of minutes. Um, so Beaujolais is exactly like Burgundy, composed of different areas. So you have the main area, which is Beaujolais, and then you have the appellation Beaujolais Village, and then the top of the top is the Cru Beaujolais. And you have 10 villages that can be called Cru Beaujolais. They're all on the map. So Julina, Saint-Amour, Moulin Avant, Chénas, Fleury, Chirouble, Morgon, Régnier, Brouilly, and Côte de Brouilly. And those are the 10 villages that can be called. Um, so Beaujolais Nouveau. So this is a nice picture of, of Brouilly. This is the granitic soil. So completely different than what's above in the Maconnais and what's above in the Côte d'Or. Um, and the picture. The grape varietal is different in Beaujolais. So we are growing Gamay and not Pinot Noir. And at the limit between Beaujolais and Burgundy, sometimes they grow uh, Pinot Noir. And there's another wine that you can find on the market called Pastou Grain. It's, it's coming from Burgundy and it's literally a blend of Pinot Noir and Gamay. Mm. Pastou Grain means use the leftover grains. Pass to les grains. You just using everything that you have left. So, 96 villages, 13 appellations, but only 10 crus. 
This is the production. And what you can see, the primer cases, those are the Beaujolais Nouveau. So what is Beaujolais Nouveau? When you get the grapes from the vineyard, you're going to macerate the red. Uh, as soon as the fermentation is over, you're going to press and you're going to get wine. And then you will start to do the élevage. So the élevage, you're going to decide how you want the wine to age before bottling it. When you do Beaujolais Nouveau, as soon as the fermentation and the wine is ready, back in 1800, people would put the, the Beaujolais in barrels and ship it to the restaurants next and near Lyon. Uh, Lyon, which is a really famous gastronomical city. There's a lot of Lyonnaise cuisine, a lot of very famous chef. And back in 1800, in the Bouchon Lyonnais, those small restaurants, they used to buy each bouchon would buy one tank, one barrel of the, the, the Beaujolais that was just made. And that was a celebration of the end of the harvest and the fact that the, the new wine would be ready and released on the market. And at the time, what they did is just open the barrel, take a picture, a pitcher, and just pour the pitcher in the barrel and put that on the table and that would be your Beaujolais Nouveau. So a wine that was not matured for a long time in a barrel or in stainless steel tank. And it was just the celebration of the end of the harvest. Oh. So nowadays, we are still doing that tradition, but instead of doing it at the end of the harvest, we allow a little bit of aging process, very short, and by law, the third Thursday of November, so the Thursday before Thanksgiving, is the Beaujolais Nouveau Day. So everywhere in the world, we're going to ship the cases. And on that specific day would be all over the world, the celebration of the end of the Beaujolais harvest. And it's called the Beaujolais Nouveau. And as you can see, uh, from the Beaujolais area in the Beaujolais village, one third, roughly one third of the production would go into the Beaujolais Nouveau. So it, it's a pretty big market and a pretty big celebration. Um, Beaujolais by itself is roughly um, eight, nine, nine million cases. So Burgundy 17, Beaujolais nine. Wow. All right. So I hope you all have a glass with you and I hope you all uh, have some delicious Chardonnay um, from Joseph Drouin. So now that you went through that webinar, you know that if it says Burgundy or Bourgogne on the label, and if it's white, you're probably drinking 99.9% .9 of the time, you're going to drink Chardonnay. Um, this specific Chardonnay, I love showing it because it's a blend of different terroir and different areas of Burgundy. So you have the best of all the areas and it makes that wine very complex. Mm. And it makes a very complex wine at a very, very affordable price, which is even better. So you have some grapes uh, from Chablis, you have some grapes from the Côte d'Or, and you have some grapes from the Maconnais. Everything is vinified separately. Some of it is aged in stainless steel barrel. Some of it is aged in oak, especially if you're coming uh, from the Côte d'Or, all the grapes coming from the Côte d'Or, this is, this is very good material. So we will use a little bit of oak barrel on that. And at the end, when the wine is, is ready, when every single plots are ready, we're going to do an assemblage. So we're going to blend all those areas. And sometimes we're going to add a little more Chablis. Sometimes we're going to add a little more Maconnet, depending on the vintage, to create a very well balanced and enjoyable white wine. And I have some in my glass, and I can tell you that. It's delicious. It's absolutely delicious. And if I can add, if you don't have this bottle, you can definitely find it on Urban Wine Club. We're featuring both the Lafayette uh, Bourgogne White and the Bourgogne Rouge or Red. Absolutely. And thank you. Red. That's a red. Yes. And so this, yeah, yeah, yeah. this is the red. So same exact idea. 
the reds. Um, <clears throat> the La Forêt Red is a blend of different areas um, of Burgundy. You can add a little bit of the um, Côte de Nuit, mostly Côte de Bonne, and a little bit of, um, the, there's, I, I believe there's some Mercure in there as well. So this is the, the um, um, southern part of, of the Bonne area, right before the Macone. Um And again, I mean, I am dying to taste that wine because I'm sure it's absolutely delicious, but I'm going to finish my white. And I'm going to enjoy a little bit of red. And I'm happy to talk about uh, and have a discussion about what do you think of the wine? What are the, the primary um, flavor of the wine? What a good Chardonnay should taste like? Because that's also. When I'm on the market, what's that's one of the, the things that I'll get all the time. It's either, oh, I love Chardonnay or I hate Chardonnay. But what does that mean to love or to hate Chardonnay? Because Chardonnay is a Chardonnay is just a vector. And then you decide what you do with your Chardonnay. If you want to over oak your Chardonnay, that's absolutely fine. But obviously it's gonna taste really, really okay. Sometimes Chardonnay are very buttery because again, it's, it's over commented. This is not the expression of a Burgundian Chardonnay. Burgundian Chardonnay are not over oaked. They are not over buttery and they are very elegant, very clean, very lean, very mineral expression of Chardonnay. So if you don't like mineral and lean, do not go for that and maybe go for a, a California Chardonnay or uh, Oregon Chardonnay, that's gonna be more in your palate. If you want something lean and clean and mineral and delicious, I'm not saying that California is not delicious, I'm just saying that this is more my taste, go for a Chardonnay made in Burgundy. So same thing for the Pinot Noir. So Pinot Noir by definition is the true expression of elegance. Um, it is complex. If it's a Pinot Noir from Burgundy, it's gonna be very organic. So you will have different layers of fruits and you will have different layers of organic materials in your glass. So when you smell it, you know that it can only come from that area of the world. Mm. Smell a Pinot Noir from Burgundy, it comes from Burgundy and you know it just by smelling it. Um, I'm, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna make a comment that this, this uh, Pinot Noir is probably one of the better Pinot Noirs I've ever had. Thank you for that. And you can definitely taste the elegant. That mm. word is, is uh, right on because to me, elegance is, you know, balance. And you can definitely understand balance with this wine from the beginning to the finish. Absolutely. There's nothing sticking out of the glass. Mm. Uh, I just wanted to point it out as well that, um, so the Véronique Drouin um, is a female winemaker and you can feel that, that feminine, elegant touch in your wine. But the family Drouin has been working since I would say 50 years with a female winemaker. And this is the characteristic of the Drouin family. It's the elegance and the finesse. And I truly believe, and they were, they were pioneers of having a female winemaker back in the 60s, where in Burgundy was more a masculine world. And they were the one making the choice to hire a female winemaker because they wanted that, that finesse, mm. not that, that masculine, powerful, extra tannins expression of Pinot Noir. So just apparently. That, that's a, a very important uh, historical you can note. Yes, yes. Great. Excellent. Wow. Um, I mean, at least for myself, still being you know a lover of wines from Burgundy, I still now appreciate even more from the simple approach of how you broke it down, Nathan, from classifications to the you know the importance of microclimates, distinguishing the differences in the wine. Um, the you know the commitment that these families have uh, from generations to maintain the integrity of wines from this area. Absolutely yes, and and I'm really happy that 
I could share my, my passion for Burgundy because again, it's, it's a true passion and so many wine regions out there, right? There are so many good wines from all over the world. You just have to find your sweet spot and maybe your sweet spot today is something and maybe your sweet spot in a year, in two years, in five years would be different. Mm. Expo exposing what Burgundy is with all the historical facts and, and all the hard work that has been going on in the vineyard, it's extremely important for me. And I really appreciate the opportunity that you gave me to share a little bit of that with your members. Well, thank we want to, to have our pleasure. We want to thank you for your time and, and involvement in allowing ourselves to let our audience know that, you know, you can definitely appreciate wine from an area that's unknown because of the way, you know, it's the principles that you presented of what it means to drink well-made wine. And, you know, well-made wine could be subjective to people because of, you know, you said personal taste, personal preferences. But for us, the bigger picture is what's happening in the vineyard to make wine. And it all starts in the vineyard. So that's what we're big advocates. Um, and we've definitely spoke to you and to our audience moving forward. You know, we're going to be definitely presenting more material content and videos on uh, the importance of wines from uh, producers and regions that are practicing um, wines from, you know, uh, biodynamic producers, uh, wines that are made clean. And the word clean is something that's popping up uh, everywhere now and, and folks want to know what, what does that mean clean wine uh, because they're so unaware of what's going on in wine production uh, that we're going to con constantly advocate for wines coming from productions and producers like yourselves great thank you That's and uh, coming from somebody who is not you know uh, a professional wine person uh, it well, really what you say? Well, the, 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 you just said, so the, it, does it dictate the volume of how professional you are or just the knowledge? Because you drink enough wine to be a professional. <laughs> okay, well, yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, you, you guys, coming from your points of view, I completely understand because you guys are very technical. You understand uh, composition. You understand everything. Just as a wine drinker, it, 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 it truly is. Uh, I had the Pinot. I'm, I'm assuming the, the the white wine was was just as good, but the Pinot is just it's something it's something else. Uh, he told me that um, he generally doesn't drink Pinot, but if it's from Burgundy, he will. And I thought that was a little like uh, interesting. And then when I had it, I was like, I totally understand because I've had a lot of Pinots, and this is definitely, if not the best. Absolutely up there. And it could very well be the best because I can't think of anything right now that would beat this, this burger, you know, right now. The way I look at this line from uh, Joseph Drouin is it's the, it opens the gates for people to appreciate and understand wine from this area. Absolutely. This is, this is your answer to the world of Burgundy. Yes. You have a, you have a high quality product at a really affordable and the other thing, Ari, we should mention before we wrap up this uh, wonderful session is that Nathan is local. And when I mean local, because we're, we're, you know, we're broadcasting from the Boston area. Absolutely. Is that Nathan also uh, owns a wonderful restaurant wine bar in Boston that we should definitely make our audience aware of that as well. Absolutely. You can a find great, great place. The wines that you feature uh, that's from your portfolio and as well as I'm sure other great wines but let's just quickly announce um, your your inclusion in this restaurant in Boston yeah so um, so yeah it's a, it's a small wine bar on Newbury Street uh, it's called 1855 wine bar um, it's uh, it's a small cozy very nice easy Come the way you are, and if you don't know anything about wine, we will take care of you. If you know a lot about wine, we will share our passion, and we're just going to sit down with you and have you taste some wine. You can literally decide if you like the wine or not, and you're going to have a true wine um, 
I think you transport your guests uh, to this, France. This is that's the idea. Yeah, yes. By the yes. environment and the, and the ambiance and the energy that's in yeah. your Yeah, the atmosphere is absolutely amazing. It's 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 a very very comfortable place. It's a very uh, like Nathan said, cozy. Uh, you you go in there and you just and relax and enjoy your wine, enjoy your food, enjoy friends. Uh, I found that when we went fluffy. Uh, when I first met you, Nathan, and it, it was just a, a great experience, and I could see any wine lover or any newbie to wine having an amazing time at your restaurant. Yes, excellent. Yeah. excellent. There's only a couple of things in the world: good wine, good food, good friends. Right. Those are, the, those, are the, those are the pillars of 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 enjoying life. Absolutely. And uh, Nathan, this is this is our one of our first webinars with you. Um, it's not going to be the last webinar because we want to definitely continue to explore Burgundy and maybe we can do some sessions where we break down just specific uh, appellations in Burgundy. Absolutely. I would love to do that. And um, if there's Ari, any last minute, if there, have we missed any questions or any last yeah, minute? Well, there, I noticed that there was a comment, not a question, but uh, the comment uh, was the biodynamic comment uh, from, from Nathan is fascinating about Burgundy. Thank you for explaining. So, uh, yeah, Nathan, you 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 gave some You're great welcome. great information about a truly amazing area of the world and a place that that just produces great wine. I've had Burgundy wines. I, I mean, I don't know. I can't really remember offhand because, like I said, I used to just drink wine and whatever it was. Like, um, but then when I started drinking enough wine, I started to really take into consideration what I'm drinking. And tonight we tasted, I tasted this, this Pinot Noir from Burgundy and I am sold. I am, I'm a newfound fan and I don't know if I could ever go back to something else because it, it's that good. It is that good. And, we don't and, want you to go back to anything. <laughs> but no, this is great. Uh, this is awesome. Uh, I'm, I'm really happy that I could take you and your audience um, to my world and I would be happy. Next time you travel, when the borders are open again, and if you want to visit Burgundy, uh, please hit me up. I would be happy to um, send you to the right spots. So uh, We also just got a comment from Steve. Nice job all. Can't wait to try the wine and visit 1855 soon. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Steve. You for the I want to personally thank Steve, good friend of ours. Great advocate and supporter. And thanks for joining this session. And we should definitely meet Steve for a glass of wine at 1855. Absolutely. Oh, and last thing. If the, turn, uh, the third Thursday of November, you want to celebrate the end of the harvest with some Beaujolais Nouveau, I believe that your Bain Wine Club will have some good Beaujolais Nouveau. For Correct. You. Yes. So keep... Um, Keep uh, keep connected. We'll keep you posted. Once that Beaujolais Nouveau arrives, you know it will go like gangbusters. So we'll definitely have some. This is so a we will have wine. This is a wine that you pop on that day. Okay, so so stay stay connected. Follow us. Um, we will make announcements. Um, we'll let you know. Jump on it very quickly. We want to thank Nathan once again. Amazing, amazing information. Amazing wine amazing place on this planet thank you for for sharing that with us thanks everybody out there for joining us thank you for watching and listening and thank you Fati, as always for hosting a, an amazing webinar and thank you for bringing nathan to us and thanks everybody out there we appreciate you we love you drink some good wine from burgundy and we'll see you guys next time thank you so much cheers thank thanks you all. bye bye Bye-bye. Thank you. Bonsoir. Bonsoir.